Welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host, Lisa Ann. I want to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your listening experience. I just got an email from Kay letting me know that I have reached 200,000 downloads on the Lisa Ann Experience. This is pretty, pretty, pretty exciting. And I owe it all to you. I owe it to you to keep me inspired to have conversations like the one I just had that I'm going to share with you today that is absolutely spectacular. It was so good we couldn't stop it. So I'm going to keep this monologue short because you've got a robust conversation to enjoy. But a couple of things we got to catch up on. I'm embarking on many travel adventures, which I'm really excited about. You can follow along always at The Real Lisa Ann on all social media. But yesterday I was doing some fine tuning on what I need to know, things that may have changed in the production of an audiobook. The first week in February, I'll be traveling to Nashville to be in the studio with Kay and we'll be recording the audiobook. And what's new is there's new distribution channels for audiobooks. I had no idea. In 2020, when I recorded my first audiobook, it was audible, right? It was just audible. You went to Amazon, you got audible. Now there's a variety. So I put a poll as soon as I got done with this call, which I learned Spotify, which makes perfect sense because so many people are on Spotify for everything, their music, their podcasts, and now their books. So as I was going through how the money is split. Because of course, if you're exclusive with Amazon for Audible, you make more money. But if you're on another distribution and they share it to Audible, you make less money because Amazon wants you to be. But I really wanted to know where my listeners listen. And I was fascinated to hear of how many different platforms you can now enjoy audiobooks. And when I put out that poll, I was shocked to find that it is still at this point tied between Spotify and audible. So this is so cool. And part of me being involved in so many things, whether it's my Wednesday night shows on better sports network, whether it's writing the audiobook, the creation of so many different things, you're always learning. And what I see now more than ever is things are coming at us fast. Things are changing fast. Technology is changing fast and not just the technology, but the user and how content is being consumed. So for all of you out there who may have voted on that poll, it was really helpful to me because it's helping me make the decision on how I'm going to be, how I'm going to distribute this audiobook. And I'm really excited about recording it because I'm really proud of this book. And once I record, well, then I have the, that's the final step in the life back. And I could start to get my wheels churning about maybe something else I'd like to write about since let's face it, I like the process of writing. I like sharing books. I've loved showing up at Exotica's with my books. I love signing books. I love sending out books and I love reading books. So there's going to be a reading book topic in the mailbag. Cannot give that away though, right away. We are going to go right into this because you're going to love this. Did you know, a little fun fact for you, June 12th, 1972, I'm giving you that date for a very important reason. Now, mind you, I was one month and three days old at that time, but something that's been woven into my life, a part of who everyone, how everyone and why everyone knows me is the adult community, right? Well, June 12th, 1972 was the day of the release of the most well-known movie in a genre that was not really created yet, in a world that had not been established yet. And today, I get to talk to the son of the creator of the historic film celebrating its 50-year anniversary. That would be Deep Throat. If you haven't seen it, find it and see it. There've been documentaries done about, there's a lot of writing done about it, but the history that you're going to learn about from that date of that release, which then movies were consumed in a theater. There was no distribution at home yet. And so having this conversation 
with Gerard Damiano Jr. and talking all about his father and what it was like to grow up. This story is just beautiful. Before I get to the interview, this is the perfect time for me to remind you to go to ultrafarmrx.com forward slash Lisa. It's a very simple two minutes. You can fill out a survey. A licensed physician will contact you. You're going to be able to get your generics, Viagra, Cialis. You are going to love the process here and everything will be delivered in discreet packaging to you. So a little word from my sponsor. Ever feel like your performance just doesn't measure up? Does worrying about it make it worse? Let me let you in on a little secret. Many men use Viagra and Cialis not just to treat ED, but to boost their performance and last longer. Whether you're in front of the camera or behind closed doors, every man can use a little help to last longer. It's never been simpler to get what you need. At ultrafarmrx.com, you can get doctor-trusted treatments 100% confidential online from your phone. No awkward doctor visits. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. Discreet and confidential, guaranteed. Better performance is just a few clicks away at ultrafarmrx.com. I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And I definitely know that I will be seeing Gerard and his sister in the near future. I was able to meet him through Lainey Spicer, PR to the stars. Enjoy this conversation. Lean in the history, the 50 year anniversary of Deep Throat, the movie with his son, Gerard Damiano. Today, I get to share a conversation that is so incredibly exciting and also a very important time as it is the 50-year anniversary of the release of Deep Throat, the movie. And I'm sitting here today with the son of the writer, the director of Deep Throat himself, and that is Gerard Damiano Jr. How are you today, Damiano? I'm doing very well, Lisa Ann. Thank you so much for having me. I found this fascinating to go down the rabbit hole and understand the timeline. So we're looking at a 50 year anniversary for one of the, the most iconic movies to ever be released in the adult world. You were how old when this movie was being produced? Um, I was seven and my sister was six years old. And your father was a creator of many projects. This was something that you were brought into. Did you understand the depths of the entire project that you were a part of? Um, well, I think it's it's it, it must be said that as a seven-year-old and my sister as a six-year-old, we really didn't know what sex was. So the fact that this was a, a porn film, an adult film, you know, that didn't enter into it for us. The fact that it was a, a, a movie, our father was a filmmaker, that is something he was very passionate about and something that he shared with us. So, you know, the, uh, Deep Throat was the fourth film that he made. Um, he always um, wanted to involve us and in that we were always on set or on location scouting and, you know, cast and crew would be in our house and they were all friends and and like that. So we were very well aware that our father was a filmmaker and that was very exciting to us. Our dad made movies. You know, it wasn't later till I started to understand what kind of movies. We just knew that these were movies for grown-ups. We weren't allowed to see them. And, you know, our mother told us, you know, when you're older, then you can see your father's movies. So we were okay with that. And how long did it take from being on set, the creative side of it, to releasing, which the first release of this was actually here in New York City at a theater? Uh, yes. June 12th, 1972, Deep Throat opened at the New World Theater up on 49th Street. Of course, um, that no longer exists anymore as uh, New York City has gotten a complete makeover since then. So uh, much of... Uh, 42nd Street, you know, Times Square area is very different. Um, so when the film was released, this was, uh, you know, roughly six months after, you know, uh, shooting began in Miami, Florida. So, um, you know, between the shooting, editing, all the post-production, um, our father 
you know, was involved in every aspect. He, he wrote the script, he directed, you know, all the, the, the scenes. And then um, not only did the editing himself, but um, selected all the music, um, wow. was involved in, in writing the lyrics to any of the, the, the songs that, that you hear in the film um, that have lyrics that aren't, you know, of, of course, the original songs. He did use some, um, some library music, but also some songs that had been popular. Um, they re-recorded versions of those songs and, uh, and so forth. And I mention that because as we've been showing the film, um, people really respond to the soundtrack. You know, the, um, the movie itself is a comedy. Now, a lot of people might not know that because, you know, Deep Throat is infamous. People have been talking about it, protesting it, praising it for 50 years. Um, today, everybody seems to know it. I mean, my sister and I uh, just did uh, a tour of Europe where we showed the film um, in Germany and Italy and Holland and Belgium. Um, everybody knows Deep Throat. But we would always ask, you know, before screening, when we introduced the film, how many people have actually seen the movie? And we were surprised. One time there was in Rome, there was only one person in the audience that raised their hand. And wow. so, we, you know, a lot of people talk about it. They have very strong opinions about it. It seems that the people who have the strongest opinions are people who have never even seen the film. So, you know, they've heard something about it and then they, they you know, get all fired up, but they haven't actually seen the movie. Um, and so that's why, you know, we, once we completed the, the restoration, um, we were able to do a complete uh, 4K restoration of the wow. 35 millimeter film. Um, and we store, it, we store it back to the way that our father had originally intended. Now that was very important to us because he took his work very seriously. Um, I would have to say that that he would be the first to tell you that Deep Throat is not a very good film. He wasn't necessarily proud of it. Um, it was an early effort. All the crew um, that he worked with, they were young and learning. And um, also it was a relatively low budget. I mean, for an adult film of the time, it was a big budget, but to actually make a whole movie, it wasn't a lot of money. Um, some people work practically for free on it, but you know, they did the best they could with what they had to work with and nobody could have predicted the success of the film. Um, my father was often asked, did you know you were going to change the world when you made this movie? He would just laugh because there's no way anybody could have known the reaction, the, the popularity, the, the success, the controversy that would come out of this, you know, one 62 minute film. Now, when I say he was, you know, a little embarrassed of the film, he went on to make much better movies. So, you know, in comparison, you know, there there's other films that he would much rather have us taking around the world and showing. And, you know, we're working on those, too. But because Deep Throat is the most um, well known and also because it was one of the earliest films and it is the 50 year anniversary, we wanted to recognize that. And we thought it's a, you know, a good time to to bring it back out. Um, and, um, I should add that one of the most revolutionary things about Deep Throat is that it attracted mainstream audiences. And that's something that hadn't really happened. The idea of feature length adult films was relatively new. Um, there was at that period, you know, coming out of the 1960s, exploitation, sexploitation films, but not hardcore films. That was usually, you know, the what's referred to as stag films, you know, like that loops where you would just see, you know, sex. But that's something that was, you know, either at a peep show on 42nd Street or maybe the yep. basement of the Knights of Columbus Hall at a bachelor party yep. or something that would yep. come out. But um, with Deep Throat, this was the first time that people and by people, I mean women couples together were going to 42nd Street into a movie theater to watch hardcore sex on the big screen. And that was something very, very new at the time. Um, and, and It was groundbreaking. So, it was groundbreaking um, at the time. It really was. Well, Deep Throat is credited to um, with crossing over into the mainstream because, you know, up until that time, you know, 42nd Street, if you went into the, the theaters there, there would be what my dad would refer to as the raincoat crowd. And these mm -hmm. are 
men that would have their raincoats oh, or they'd have such newspapers. an old expression. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Know? They have newspapers and they'd sit there with newspapers in their lap. And if you were in the theater, all you would hear is newspapers rustling for the whole show. <laughs> um, so the fact that shortly after its release, you had couples going out on dates to see the movie and you had celebrities, you had dignitaries from the UN, you literally had the police officers that had busted the film. Once it got back on the screen, they were all back to see the movie. Um, so it really created a sensation which was unprecedented. It also created and opened the door for the desire for people to find out how can we be get better quality content in our homes when, you know, you think 10 years ahead of that in the eighties was when the cable providers started trying to buy up content to have a channel that was exclusively for couples and people to be able to enjoy at home. But I want to go back to a couple of things. I think 50 years ago, for the first five years, 10 years, 20 years of Deep Throat, everyone saw it. But we live in a different generation now with clickbait where people see a title, they assume they know the contents of that title, whether it be a news article, whether it be a movie, and they're able to then judge from what they have perceived. And the name Deep Throat gives that. But if you go back and you went back to the population being a lot less, of course, in the 70s, but I bet you more people watched it in the 70s than the people that are looking at the name of it right now and assume that they know what it is. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. In, um, in the 1970s, it became the in thing to do. You weren't cool if you hadn't seen Deep Throat. And there were some notable celebrities that saw it many, 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 many times. I mean, Frank Sinatra had his own copy of it, and he would have parties and bring everybody to his house and, and show it and, and like that. And so um, it, it was not only you know trendy and popular, it's still considered to be the most profitable film of all time. In that, um, and that's not to say that it's made more money than Avatar or Black Panther or whatever. No, that's but it, but yeah, for the the return on investment for the money that it cost to make, um, compared to the money that it brought in, no film has been able to touch that. Now, you know, again, that shows you how many people actually went to the theater to see the movie. I mean, it was hard for young people today to imagine because most porn is consumed, you know, on a smartphone under the covers yep. like that or whatever, or couples for together. Free. It's now free. more of a, yeah. uh, you know, what would have been called then a marital aid. And that happened with the advent of video where um, what my father was interested in, in was making movies. He got into making adult films, you know, by default. That wasn't his goal. That wasn't his aspiration. It was the entry level position. It was the only way in New York City that you could get work on a film unless you would come from Hollywood and you know had gone to UCLA Film School or or whatever. Um, that there were these exploitation, sexploitation productions that were happening, and this was before what we call independent films. You know, they were called underground films then. Later, you know, with indie films, that became a thing. And, you know, that's now that's been co-opted as well. But back then, if you wanted to make movies, there was work, but they were these low budget, you know, productions. And so my father, um, he got into the business actually through his accountant. Now, um, he was a hairdresser at the time and he had a beauty salon. Um, you know, my, my mother worked as the receptionist. He was the manager and also cut hair. And that's what he was doing. But he grew up in New York during the Great Depression. He loved movies. He would, would tell me stories of, you know, his mother would put him, you know, would give him a dime and an a empty gla glass jar and set him loose on a Saturday. And he said that for 10 cents, you could, you know, ride the streetcar down to 42nd Street, or you could, you know, ride the, the, the subway. You could then go um, see two movies and cartoons and a newsreel and all of this. And he brought the jar because if you went to get a drink at the concession stand, you could bring your own cup and it would be a penny less if you brought your own cup. So he said, for 10 cents, I would have a whole day and then go home and bring my mom back the change. So it's hard wow. to imagine, you know, a world like that. Also, in today's world, just cutting your kid loose and letting him go to 42nd Street on his own on the streetcar <laughs> when he was, you know, nine years old, you know, but my, 
my father grew up loving films, but never dreamed that he could actually make them himself. He just thought, you know, that's Hollywood. That's, you know, another thing. But um, on that day, when his accountant said, you know, I've got a client who's in town and he's making a film and, you know, they're looking for people to to help. It doesn't pay anything, but you could if you want to volunteer, you can go down there and be on the film set. And so my father jumped at the chance to do this. And, you know, what what he's he told me and he's he's said many times before, when I walked onto that set, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Just being there, seeing the, you know, the hot lights and the camera equipment and all the people, technicians all working together just to get that shot, you know, it it changed his life. So he met everybody there. And, you know, in that underground film scene, everybody worked on each other's movies. So he met a bunch of folks and they said, well, we're so-and-so shooting next week. Why don't you come and help? Now, he always had a big Cadillac, you know, he, he... Loved to drive the Cadillac, so he had a car with a big trunk that could carry a lot of gear, and so okay. he worked as a production assistant, you know. And so my mom kept the the beauty salon going while he would be running off on weekends to work on these productions whenever he could. And in that way, he learned filmmaking just being on the set, just seeing the you know the the mechanics, the the nuts and bolts of how it was done. He didn't you know go to film school and study theory and so forth. But he watched a lot of movies growing up. And then when he saw how it all came together, um, he decided that he wanted to devote himself to making films. And that's how he got into the business. Now, Deep Throat was obviously his most profitable film, not just because of the low cost to make Deep Throat, the quick turnaround, but within the first six weeks, it brought in a million dollars and then it brought in on an average of 600 million total in history. Is that correct, Gerard? Um, I'm not sure about the first figure that you, you stated, the, you know, six weeks, a million dollars. I think that it made a bit less, but it did after the first week. Um, I have an article that was in Variety magazine that said this could very well have set a record for attendance at one theater in a week. It made so much money. And it was making at this theater like $8,500 a day, which wow. for one theater in 1970s money, that was huge. Yes. And, you know, a, a real testament to Deep Throat um, is that, at, you know, years later, you know, after my father went on to make other films, the whole um, porno, porno chic and the golden, what we call the golden age of porn happened. Yep. Deep Throat played in, in a few theaters. The one that I eventually saw it at myself on 42nd Street, it was a double feature, Deep Throat and Devil and Miss Jones. And it played at that theater for more than 10 years. So to imagine wow. a movie in a movie theater, a movie theater that just played one movie or the same two movies over and over and over and over for a decade. There was a theater out in L.A. that, that did the same thing. Um, there was a, a theater in, in Key West as well that just played the same movie for years. And um, it always had it always drew a crowd. Everybody wanted to, you know, had to see the film that you weren't supposed to see. Um, so. So, and yes, to think there- now that, you know, a movie comes out and if you don't rush to the theater to see it, it's gone. Next thing you know, you're catching it on a flight. Like the turnaround now is so fast. And also to think how far we've gone back in time that other than maybe in San Fran and a couple small areas, there's very few places where you can watch an adult film on a big screen. Um, yeah, I can. I can think of very few in this in this country, and you know the one that I that I know of in LA, you know, is is closing down. <laughs> so, you know, it it is a very different world than just in the way these films are are seen and the the role that they play in people's lives. You know, we spoke about um, in the early days you had to go to a movie theater, and that was a very different experience. And again, that's something difficult for young people today to understand because it wasn't, you know, this private moment that you had a, a, alone with your pants down or with your partner or partners or whatever, you know, it was, you'd have to go out in public and sit in a theater with, a, with a, maybe you would see a celebrity, maybe there was, you know, your elementary school teacher is there or somebody, but you had to go and sit um, in a communal setting 
and have a theatrical experience. If the joke was funny, everybody laughed. If uh, you know people were scared, everybody jumps like that. It's very different than the way we think of porn today, because back then there was no industry. You know, there were these exploitation, sexploitation films. There's always been a market for sex. I mean, you know, they. It's been said that you know when the camera was invented. Five minutes later, somebody put a naked lady in front of it, you know, like that. I mean, there's early cave paintings. So, you know, it's always, it, it's, you know, a, a universal experience. It's something that's integral to our existence as a species. So it's, it's there. But to then see it on, on screen in an explicit way, it took a long time for that to actually happen. And it, the window kind of opened and closed because, you know, what happened um, was that Deep Throat and then um, Behind the Green Door, which came out just a few months later on the West Coast, um, yep. was part of what I would call the collective unconscious. You know, my, my father and the Mitchell brothers were not working together. They were just kind of working on the same thing at the same time, that there was, you know, this need that people wanted um, to see explicit content. And there was a you know, there's a bit of hy- uh, hypocrisy in America. I mean, today, but... Uh, also back back then where you know when my father got into the adult film industry as we call it now but you know it was again just underground films in 1968 this was the summer of love so this was you know a cultural revolution in the united states where people were were um, exploring their sexuality they were being more open and free uh, there were love-ins and so forth people were expanding their minds but if you turned on the tv you know there's lucy and ricky and they're sleeping in separate beds you know yes. you, you couldn't even show two people in the same bed together even like having no. a conversation you know there the hollywood you know standard i think was that if two people were in bed one person had to have one foot on the floor. Foot on the floor. That was the standard. Yes, you had to have one foot on the floor. Yes. And, and so there was a real disconnect between what was happening in people's lives and what was, you know, happening in films and on, on TV. And so when Deep Throat came out and Behind the Green Door, it, you know, that's what really blew the lid off the whole thing, where suddenly there was like a rush because everybody, you know, wanted to see this kind of stuff. And and, you know, more importantly, you know, I think that the, you know, the the real contribution of Deep Throat, if 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 there, you know, if there is one, if I may say, was that it really opened up a dialogue because of the the title Deep Throat. OK, it was very catchy and people oh Deep Throat. What's Deep Throat? Have you seen Deep Throat? It got people talking about sex and sexuality. But also once you see the film. You you know, people are surprised that it goes against all the stereotypes of porn today where it's, you know, it's not um, misogynistic. The women are not objectified in the film. On the contrary, you know, the women are the protagonist. It's Linda's story. She's front and center. It's about her quest for sexual fulfillment. The men are objectified. I mean, in one scene, literally, they have numbers, not even names. You're number 11. You're number 12. OK, you know, the 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 women are, are the heroes of the story, you know, and, and that was something very new. I mean, that was more controversial than seeing a 30 foot blow job on the screen was having a movie in 1972 that had a woman who wasn't just the, the sidekick or the arm candy or the prize at the end of the race where, you know, he gets the girl or whatever. No, it was, it was her story. And that was something I think refreshing. And also, you know, dare I say, the ridiculous plot of the clitoris in the throat. You know, the truth was in 1972, a lot of men didn't know where the clitoris was to begin with or didn't even know what a clitoris was. So it might as well have been in the throat. So to see that movie, suddenly it got people talking. And my father felt that in some ways it actually helped people and helped marriages because, you know, there are people that were repressed, that never tried oral sex in any way. And now they see it and they're like, well, maybe we should bring that home. Maybe we should try that. Maybe we should explore a little more. You know, once people had a chance to see what other people were actually doing, um, they were able to to experiment in their own relationships. You know, my, and I think my- on the you, you bring up the, the women. 
I think it was such a liberating film for women because there were women that had these feelings that they wanted to be more assertive sexually. They felt a confidence, but they didn't know how to manage that confidence. They, no one had ever showed them. And so Deep Throat gave them that vision of, oh, this is what I'm feeling. This is how I should enjoy it. And today's consumption of adult content is very different. I feel today people watch adult content for an instant gratification, you know, to, to get off in one way, shape or form. Right. Whereas mm -hmm. the film and looking at deep throat was couples that would then watch it together and then go home and then have, they, it would carry over. So mm -hmm. they took the excitement that they felt and they were patient with it because we weren't living in an instant gratification society mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. And they took that home and they replayed it. And then they probably brought it up. It's Saturday night, the week later. Mm -hmm. And that's why people wanted to go back and see it again, because mm -hmm. they wanted to continue to touch those feelings. They wanted to remind themselves and it was the perfect time with, you know, the summer of love with people really exploring themselves sexually in a very repressed. It's strange how we've kind of gone back in time with how we view content again. And I know deep throat then became a term and it then also resurfaced during Watergate. And mm -hmm. that must've been fascinating. <laughs> well, that's that's very true, and and I mean I agree with everything that you've just said is is true. But I'll touch since you brought up Deep Throat and Watergate, I would say this that that first of all, my father was more proud of coming up with the term Deep Throat than he was with making the movie because it made it into the dictionary. And he said to me, <laughs> "I made a word. How many people you know that made up a word? You know, forget the movie." That you know, there was, you know, and now when you look up Deep Throat, there's two meanings. But now the first meaning has become, you know, the insider informant, you know, after the Watergate, you know, uh, case. And so, you know, my father was was very proud of, of that. And also, you know, I think it, it bears mentioning that there was, you know, then a war on pornography. And yes. um there was a, a study started by by Lyndon Johnson that then was taken over by Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon is, you know, kind of part of, of his platform was, you know, cleaning up America. He was um, against uh, pornography. And so he uh, went on the attack. And, you know, my father was arrested. He was dragged into court. All the people involved in the movie um, were prosecuted. Um, and Harry Reams, you know, Herb Stryker, the, the actor known as Harry Reams, was prosecuted. Um, and this went on for some years. And in the end, you know, my father was very proud to say that, that um, Nixon tried to take down Deep Throat. But in the end, it was Deep Throat to take down Nixon. That must have been a stressful time for your family. I mean, because at that point, the government is against you. They're writing the rules. You don't know how to fight back properly. It's costly to have a lawyer. And here you were writing the success of something that had brought so much joy. And you take a couple of years of your life of dealing with lawyers and family stress. Well, well, that's absolutely true, Lisa Ann. And I'm glad that you, you, know, you had the insight to consider that. Because for my sister and myself as children, you know, we knew that the film was popular, that our dad was becoming a celebrity. You know, he would get stopped on the street. You know, <laughs> he's very recognizable. You know, he had a lot of style. You know, he was, you know, so living in New York City, you know, we would get stopped and people would ask for his autograph and like that. But also when the prosecution began, um, our father was very stressed. And this is something that, you know, children are very sensitive we picked up on that. We didn't know the whole story, but we knew that he was troubled. I mean, he'd be angry. One yeah. night he tore the phone off the wall. Um, and I remember vividly the day that um, FBI agents came to the house and took him wow. away. And, you know, my mother told me the, the rest of the story later. You know, I have been, you know, researching. I've been working, I work with my father together on a, on a book about his life. 
Um, so I've got a lot more information now than I did then. But I remember, you know, we were playing outside the house and the black car pulls up and, you know, the, the men in black get out and they step over us and go into the house and, you know, they're in there for a while. And my mother, you know, later told me that she pleaded with them not to put him in handcuffs. She said, in you know, front the children of you. Are, yeah, the children yes. are outside. Oh. I don't want them to see their father, you know, in chains, you know, being oh. brought out of the house and taken yes. away. And now later that day, the way my father told me the story, you know, he was taken, you know, into this into the city. I think he was at, you know, 100 Center Street, which is, the you know, the police station. But with he was with these federal agents. He was there all day long. And, you know, he said that it's like we were all pals. We were smoking cigarettes. They all asked me for my autograph. We were hanging out. We were talking and laughing and making jokes and whatever. But he said, I was there for hours and hours and wondering, you know, what, what was going on. And then he said, you know, well, he said, and then at a certain point, they said, okay, it's time to go. And they all got up. And then they brought the handcuffs. And they said, we're going to have to put these on you. And he's like, what? You know, why? You know, it's not a violent criminal. You know, and so sure enough, they cuffed him behind his back and led him out of the building. And it was the the perp walk. You know, they had to. It was all day to get the media assembled and get sure, everyone. Sure, of course, they wanted they wanted to, the government wanted to look good, see what we're doing here. This is going to be on all the newspapers. We're mm. going to make a show of this. Oh, yes, we're we're cleaning up New York. We're cleaning up America. We're stamping out this scourge of pornography. You know, God forbid mm. we talk about sex in this country. So. You know, that night we were sent to our grandparents' house with the strict instructions to not turn on the TV. I mean, my grandparents would always watch the evening news, but that night, you know, we did not have the TV on. And it was only later that, you know, I saw the mugshot and I heard the, the whole story and, and so forth. And, you know, that was very traumatic for my father, but it also, you know, it, it helped him to um, really be serious about the fight for um, free speech. He was anti-censorship in his very earliest films. He spoke about, you know, this, again, hypocrisy where, you know, violence is rampant and you could turn on, you know, the, the TV. And when we were kids, you know, the Vietnam War was going on and there was, you know, bloody horror on, on TV every day. But, you know, God forbid you see a naked breast. That was a scandal. You know, that was something dirty. You know, a, a mother breastfeeding her child in America is, you know, is a scandal where what could be more natural than that? So, you know, there was this, you know, again, a real hypocrisy that my father, you know, even before Deep Throat had made a couple of films where he tried to address this. And, you know, he made a documentary and then he made a, a what was then called a white coder. OK, I don't know if you know that term, the white coder films, but um, this was a genre that happened because, you know, for some years before Deep Throat, the laws were not so black and white. In other words, you know, under the First Amendment of the Constitution, we have freedom of speech, but that doesn't cover obscenity. So then it becomes the, um, the job of the courts to decide what is obscene or not obscene. So films were getting busted, you know, hardcore sex could not be shown. But um, what they found was that, you know, by definition, if a film could exhibit um, socially redeeming value, okay, that was the term that they use. If it was educational, if it was um, uh, uh, culturally important or artistic in such a way as where it was not, um, did not... Um, uh, contribute to the puerile nature or something, you know, there's some kind of legalese about that where it had to be more than just sex. It had to have yep. some kind of social redeeming value being, you know, this, you know, education or health, you know, qualities to it. Um, a number of films were made that um, would open up with a doctor or a man in a white coat. Okay. Presumably a doctor who would explain Amazing. to you how sexual deviation is caused by blah, 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 blah. And to have a healthy marriage, to have a healthy sex life, blah, sex blah, blah, life, blah yeah. to the sex. I go, okay. This makes so much mm. sense. It's mm. fascinating. I mean, the history of it is something that, you know, 
nobody really knows. I mean, those of us that have been involved, I can remember getting into the industry, you know, in the nineties and it was still kind of the end of the golden era where we're shooting on film. Um, the women were really propped up and there were so many laws in different States for distribution that it kept the movies very soft and beautiful. And there wasn't this stuff now like the choking and the smacking and the violence, you know, mm -hmm. that just, you couldn't sell it. You couldn't distribute it properly. So we didn't shoot it in case you were sent it to Florida or you sent it to mm -hmm. the Bible Belt. Remember, there were all these laws where like if, really? a, if a VHS got sent to the wrong state, somebody was getting arrested at their warehouse. But I do remember them being these peaks and valleys with different government, different policies and different states and trying to change things and trying to make it difficult and still trying to push it really underground. And where we sit now you look at Twitter, for example, if, if you ask me is the largest illegal distributor of content to minors, mm -hmm. because you can just type in the word porn in the search mm -hmm. bar on Twitter and you can be 10 years old and you can watch porn. And to yeah. think that people today don't realize that someone like your father was picked up by the FBI in front of his family and children. And luckily your mother was a savvy businesswoman from running the salon and knew how to conduct herself in this situation. Imagine if she was a stay at home. Uh, what, what did they used to call them? They weren't stay at home. Housewives. Moms. <laughs> housewives. housewives. If she was a housewife. She may not have known where to turn in this situation. Right. But she was there. But to think that these things were then actually moments for your father where he decided this happened to me for a reason. And now I get to take a stand because he had the biggest platform mm -hmm. as being everything that was Deep Throat. Mm -hmm. Well, well, that is very true. And, and thank you for acknowledging my mother because she was very savvy. And yeah. you know, I have to give credit where credit is due that my father never could have done what he did without her, without her support, where she kept the, the business going. You know, she propped him up and typed all his scripts and got him to his appointments on time and did everything and then raised us with her left hand while she was doing all of that. So, you know, that's that's very true. And she was very sharp and very savvy and did, you know, deal with these agents and then managed to kind of keep us out of the worst of it. Although, you know, again, we picked up on the stress, her anxiety, her fear. Our father had to go to court all over the country and he would be quick to say, and at my own expense, you know, if you yes. have to go, he would have to appear in places where a, a they would set it up where they weren't going to try him in Provincetown or in San Francisco or in Key West or in places that were, you know, a bit more liberal. They were going to try him in Memphis, Tennessee. Sure, the Bible in, Belt. That's the first thing they're going to do. They're going to send you to the Bible Belt. Memphis, Alabama, Florida, you know, places where they were much stricter with distribution. Yeah. And so he would have to go to Arizona or go to Covington, Kentucky to appear in court and at his own expense. And he told me, you know, I had to go to Covington. I had to pay my way to go to Covington, Kentucky to be tried for obscenity. He said, I never even made a phone call to Covington, Kentucky. You know, why there? But that's, you know, that's the way they, they did it because, of course, the, the juries would be, you know, very conservative. That, yeah, um, not liberal at all. Not liberal yeah, so, at all. No. So, you know, he had a tough go of it. And, you know, also it bears saying that Deep Throat being the most profitable film of all time, he did not see that money. You know, we didn't grow up with the six hundred million dollars at all. And that was difficult for us in that it put a strain in the fact that we were still poor. <laughs> you know, we were lower middle class and that didn't change until, you know, my father made a lot more films. And still it didn't change much because, you know, he was not a savvy businessman. He was, you know, very, you know, progressive thinker, very creative um, and a great filmmaker. But he was always just focused on the next movie. He wasn't focused on tracking down what happened to the receipts of the, the last movie. And there was a lot of unscrupulous business people out there. And he would make it very clear that, you know, the people that make films and the people that distribute films are, are two different kinds of people. And yeah. so he didn't see the profits of Deep Throat. And where I say wow. it put, that put strain on our family was just the fact that, um, in all the papers, the most profitable film, you know, breaking box office records. So everybody thought we were rich. 
And so, you know, even our family members and so forth, they thought that that we were were living the high life when really our father was, you know, still trying to to keep it going. The the beauty salon was still open until, you know, after Devil and Miss Jones came out, you know, they were still running the beauty salon. And um, you know, it just this kind of um uh miss how can I I say this? You know, fame and fortune don't always go together. Okay. No. So he, you know, he was the face of Deep Throat of this, you know, huge success, but didn't, you know, see the the profits from that. And so, you know, again, that made him, um, you know, kind of bitter about the whole thing because he wanted to move on to make better films, which he did. He would much rather we be talking about The Devil and Miss Jones or a film he did called The Story of Joanna or Memories Within Miss Aggie. You know, these were... Um, better films that, you know, they all learned as they went. You know, when I said they all, he had a very close relationship with the cinematographer um, who he named Harry Flex, who now we can say is Joao Fernandez, who, um, you know, was brilliant, but they were just kind of starting out together. So they learned as they went, they challenged themselves, they made more ambitious films every time. And that's what kind of brought on this, um, you know, what we now look back on as the golden age of porn, but this idea of porno chic, where at the time there was this kind of common belief that these films were getting more and more elaborate, more ambitious, bigger budgets, and so forth with, with you know, hardcore content. At the same time, Hollywood was starting to loosen up. And it wasn't because they had, you know, this... Um, you know, a spiritual awakening, it was because they wanted of the money. some of the money. They wanted yeah, they, some of the money. You think skin flicks on Cinemax was mm-hmm. because they were producers of mm-hmm. adult content. It was because mm-hmm. it was a grab at that time. It was mm-hmm. a money grab. Everybody was like, how can I get my hands on some of this? Now, let me ask you this. Who did get the money from Deep Throat? Um, well, the my distributors? Had, yeah. Well, my father had um, a couple of business partners that, um, you know, when he, he, got involved in making his first um, film with Damiano Productions, Gerard Damiano Productions. He had a couple of backers um, that uh, later he discovered were connected to the mob. And so when Deep Throat started making all the money that it did, he did not see those profits. They you know, basically mm. made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Um, and so, you know, he he said that he felt lucky to get out of there with his life. Um, oh, what an so, amazing life he's lived. I mean, you know, but here's the reality. We all have to realize this in life. We're not good at everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the reason I have a business manager who handles all of my stuff is so that I can be creative because mm-hmm. very common that creative people are, are not, you know, as good or at book smart or, or, mm-hmm books or collecting money, or it's hard to be the talent, the creator, the producer, the everything else, and then try to try to collect money because you are always forward looking to your next project. You are always building up that next thing. And so it's not that uncommon that somebody that's so talented gets taken advantage of in that sense, especially when it comes to money. And now here we are at the 50 year anniversary and this movie is still not been approved for the Library of Congress. Am I correct? Yes, yes. Now, you know, that's, I'm glad that you brought that up because, you know, we did a little bit of a campaign this year um, because for people that don't know, um, the Library of Congress, um, um, excuse me, um, as part of the National Film Registry, they accept 25 films per year to be preserved as part of, you know, America's cultural history. Now, this has been going on for about 35 years. They've been been doing this. Now, the selections are made by votes from, you know, the American public. And then there is a panel that chooses the 25 films. Now, any person could go on their website um, and vote for up to 50 films every year. Now, the criteria of, you know, for acceptance is that a film has to be 10 years old or older. It has to... Um, have some kind of cultural, historic, or artistic significance, which, you know, it could be argued that Deep Throat meets all of that, but certainly, yeah. you know, because of the effect that it had on not only American culture, but uh, 
the way laws were written, uh, you know, the obscenity laws, the trials that went all the way to the Supreme Court, um, in in so many ways that affected our culture. And the fact that we're still talking about it 50 years later, you know, clearly it needs to be included or accepted. Now, you know, according to their website, um, they they are looking for all genres and all aspects of, of film and filmmaking in America. Um, but so far, you know, not a single adult film. Now, there's a couple of X-rated films. I think uh, Midnight Cowboy, which is a great film that really captured the grittiness of that, you know, 42nd Street time. Yeah. You know, that was accepted. But, you know, it's not a hardcore film. Um, and so Deep Throat has, you know, for many years been overlooked. And this year, you know, my, my sister and I, you know, started a campaign and we went on social media and so forth to get people to vote, of which many, many people did. You know, we know for a fact every place we showed the movie, we talked about it. You know, people would get on their phones right there. Um, but it again, it was not accepted. Now, you know, Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein is, you know, been preserved by the National <laughs> Film Registry. So, you know, we feel that it's really been overlooked. And, you know, clearly there's, you know, politics involved in this. You know, there's, you know, one could argue the, um, you know, the, the, quality of the film, but you can't argue the cultural significance or importance, you know, for American history. So, you know, it's a film that needs to be preserved because, again, a lot of people have strong feelings about it, you know, for or against, many of which have not seen it. So the fact that it should be there to be seen so people can know what they're really, you know, what the the fuss was all about. And so that's why my sister and I took it upon ourselves to preserve the film Um you know, in a 4K restoration. Um, but we would really like for it to be recognized, you know, for what it is. And so, you know, you can still vote for it for this year, for next year and so forth. You know, we feel that that this story is not quite over, but yeah, it was a bit disappointing that once again, it was not, you know, chosen. And you would think that, you know, it would be kind of the foundational film for sex educators, um, psychologists, you know, there's so many studies that could go back to the impact that Deep Throat had in 1972 and moving forward. Well, it, it, it's funny you sh should say that because there are quite a few professors that I've spoken to that teach Deep Throat in school. Um, Constance Penley at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. She has a, a porn 101 class in the media studies um, department. And she starts every, every semester with Deep Throat on day one. Because in her opinion, that's where the adult foundation. content and media came together, you know, in the biggest way. And so, you know, we've been licensing the film to schools that are teaching the film. Now, yeah. I don't see it as sex education necessarily, no, but it's but history it's, in, it's in, in really the world about, of yeah, film history, um, you know, uh, sociology. You can talk yeah. about a lot of different topics about how you know our society deals with these issues that are so again integral to our species. Yet people still have trouble talking about them. You know, it's okay to to sell sugar water with sex, but to have like a frank conversation about the clitoris and where it is, you can't do that. Okay. It's to show so conolingus. Real. Okay. You can't yep. show that. Okay. But to use sex to sell gum or anything, you know, that's what we're bombarded with every day. And, you know, again, there's something that just does not, not connect with that. You know, there is and, a know, bit of um, hypocrisy in it. Before we hopped on here to start this lovely conversation, we were speaking a bit about Italy. You know, I've traveled the world and it was fascinating to me the first time I was overseas and saw, I, I, I think I was in Prague and I saw a commercial at night and, and it was full nudity and it was not a big thing. And I realized, mm -hmm. wait a minute. And then I realized how repressed we are here in the US, which mm -hmm. is the, supposed to be the leader in all things and how... You look at the studies, it's so different, the sex crimes in countries where they're more open and it's less hidden and it's understood and it's explored and it's shared in a beautiful way than here where it's held back so much, the crime rates are really fascinating to, to study. You know, that that's absolutely true. And this is something that my father spoke about a lot. You know, there was that study 
that um, Nixon had carried on after Lyndon Johnson started it. And the way my father explained it to me is he said they had an agenda. So they did this study and what they found was not what they were looking for. They found that actually, you know, pornographic material was healthy and helpful and gave somebody, you know, people an outlet where if they didn't have a way of expressing them, their sexuality or, or masturbating or whatever, that they were more likely to commit violent crimes, sexual crimes, and so forth. And so the, the Nixon administration threw that whole report away because it didn't do what they wanted it to do. In, in other words, it was, there was truth in it. And so it didn't help their agenda. And, you know, that is very, very important point is that in Italy, and as we spoke, I lived in Italy for years, and yes, there's full frontal nudity on television, and it's not a big deal. And my father would often say, it's only a big deal if you make it a big deal. If you don't let people see it, then it's something everybody has to see. Now, I can say the same about drinking, you know, in other countries. People drink with their children much younger and you don't hear about them binge drinking when they go away to college and abusing uh, alcohol because it's not held back. It's very similar that way. You know, thank you for saying that because that is absolutely true. You know, as I mentioned, we, my, my sister and I, we lived in Italy for some years. We witnessed this because, you know, we had grown up in New York City, but spent some time in Florida and it was all about partying is all about the drinking, 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 because here, you know, we're kids. All our parents are doing is drinking, yet we can't drink. We're not allowed to drink. So as soon as we could, that's all we wanted to do. Now, in Italy, you know, there is wine cut with water at the dinner table. Kids can have a sip. And so they are less likely to abuse that. They don't go to college so they can now start drinking full time. Nope. I mean. There's many kids in America that that's what they study is alcoholism, you know, and they're their test subjects. It's you know? very and, true. And, you know, it, it goes, it, 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 it's true with sex and sexuality. You know, we mentioned earlier that just a woman breastfeeding, you know, is in America, it's, it's, you know, they have to be all covered up and, you know, God yep. forbid you see a nipple on the train or whatever. Oh, now they have these little booths at some airports where they can go into this closed phone booth with no windows. It's like a weird looking box. And I'm like, I don't know if I'd be even comfortable sitting inside this weird box. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I, I do. I mean, I have a young child and I've, I've witnessed that, you know, not only the, the beauty of breastfeeding, but, you know, my sister and I were not breastfed as, as kids because back in the 60s, they thought, oh, no, you know, science has come up with something better, you know. <laughs> and now, you know, after 50 years, they have figured out that, oh, whoops, OK, no, it's natural, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, yes, well, was you it science in the 60s or was it the government that realized they could make money off a of formula? We'll yes. never know. But it was a little <laughs> bit of both. <laughs> yes, we had a lot more faith and, you know, that science was going to solve everything and that, you know, we're going to do nature one better. OK. And yeah. so, of course, you know, in hindsight, that was a, a big mistake. Now, touring through Italy this summer, bringing the film, you know, we were in, in Torino. Um, we showed the film. We stepped into an old church and, you know, of which they're everywhere. And yeah. there was Torino is a beautiful city. It was fabulous. And we had such a great time there. We were actually guests of the of the National Museum of Cinema. So, you know, I think that our father would have been proud to know that his film was that, you know, well respected, that we weren't showing it at the last porno theater left in, in Italy. Instead, you know, we were, you know, at this amazing institution. We showed at Cine, uh, Cinema Massimo, which is a great theater. Um, we had a really lively talk back afterwards with um, academics and, you know, film critics and like that. It was a great time. But but in the church, here's an ancient, you know, carving, a wood carving of the Madonna and child. And mm -hmm. wouldn't you know, here she is breastfeeding. OK, you know, the mother of God. OK, that what could be more beautiful or natural than that? What is a more intimate bond? You know, nurturing a child. But, you know, to see a nipple in America, you know, and I'll quote Jack Nicholson here because he had a great quote that really, to me, sums this up. He's, you know, talking about about, again, this hypocrisy in you know, in American culture and American cinema. He said, if you kiss a tit, it's an R rating, but hack it off with a sword and it's only PG. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. And it's, it's funny you say that because, you know, Instagram will 
take photos down, even if you're fully dressed, but your nipple is hard. So like if you're standing inside a, a somewhere and it's, and it's chilly and your nipple is hard, you don't even realize that you post the photo. Great. They take it down a hard nipple. Are you kidding me? This is worth, you know, but speaking of Instagram, everyone can follow inst- on you on Instagram at deep throat movie on Facebook and Twitter at deep throat film. And you also have the history on Facebook at Deep Throat Films, correct? Well, uh, Damiano Films at Damiano, Damiano Films. Damiano Films. Damiano Films. Okay, great. I'll make sure everybody has that. But Gerard, this was such a beautiful conversation. I hope that our paths cross and I can come to a live screening. I'd love to listen in on the talk back and you know, be a part of it. Um, it's fascinating what you're doing. The dictionary and Watergate will stay with me because I can picture your father having such a sense of pride of the word and then taking down Nixon who tried to take him down. There's history webbed through here and such a beautiful story. And I thank you for sharing it with me today. Well, thank you so much, Lisa Ann, for the opportunity. And I certainly do hope our paths cross. I'm sure they will. I love that conversation. I love that movie. And I love learning more about the history. And you can follow along on Instagram at Deep Throat Movie, Facebook, and Twitter, Deep Throat Films. And also there's a special page on Facebook, Damiano Films. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Before I get to the mailbag, I want to remind you, NFL season starting to wrap up. I mean, We got February 12th, the big Super Bowl. We have no idea who's going to be in because obviously I did not know the Dallas Cowboys were going to beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on Monday night and keep me up to one o'clock in the morning in just shock, which I was. But now there's going to be the, you know, NBA. After the all-star break, you're going to want to go to games. Maybe you want to go to a different event, a concert. Ticket Rev is the answer for you. Make sure you're following at Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at Ticket Rev. We're doing ticket giveaways on the regular that you are going to want to partake in. So find out everything you need to know at TicketRev.com. Go on there, see what events are near you and what you could put your price on a ticket. Or if you're a seller, maybe you have season tickets, you can't make it to all of the events. It's a great way for you to sell your tickets as well. well. It is the new innovation in buying and selling event tickets. The moment you've been all waiting for, and I've got a good one for you here. That is the mailbag. If you want to be a part of the mailbag, you can email me at asklisaann at gmail.com. I want to thank all of you for giving me better questions. I am now at the point where I am just deleting all the weird ones because I have enough good ones. This one here, it's a long one, but I think it's a great one. So I had to share it with you. Hello, Lisa. How are you doing? I will start out by saying I love to gamble. I go to Las Vegas four times a year, and my last trip was a couple of weeks ago for my 52nd birthday on January 6th. First of all, let me say happy birthday to you, Jordan. I thought I would take my daughter, a few of her college friends, and I brought a few of my friends along as well. On every one of these trips, I make everyone that is going sign a rules contract. That is fantastic. That basically outlines what is acceptable to ask my casino hostess for and not acceptable to ask my casino hostess for. It also says that anyone that breaks the rules is immediately thrown out of their room and not given a ride back on my plane. I like to take this seriously. One thing I did not know was that there was some kind of porn convention that weekend. Yup, that was AVN. Yup, you were there during AVN. One of my friends asked my Conceito hostess to arrange a party in his room with 20 porn stars. I think this goes without saying, when he said party, he really meant a night of sex. When my casino hostess brought this to my attention, I was outraged. Because of one of the rules of the list that he had signed was at not asking for women. I asked my casino hostess to lock him out of his room. He is no longer a guest of mine. I also asked her to lock him out of my account so he was done doing anything on my account. So those of you who aren't familiar, somebody who spends a lot of money in Vegas gets a hostess that will do everything from set up reservations for them at restaurants and shows. And if you have access to one of these hostess, they'll do a lot for you. So the fact that someone is sharing their hostess privileges is a big, big, big deal. I also made him find his own flight back to Denver, Colorado. 
now that you basically have an idea on what happened that weekend, I have two questions for you. First, do you think I overreacted, underreacted, or acted just right? And second, I would like to know, if, let's go to the first one first. First question here is, do I think he overreacted, underreacted, or acted just right? First and foremost, I don't think you overreacted because one of the things that that hits me right away is you are bringing your daughter and some of her college friends on this trip as well. You had family there with you. And you also have a rule about no women. Solicitation of prostitution is not legal in the city of Las Vegas. There are brothers outside of the city, but that has not changed. So the risk then being taken with a name being in a room being in your name and some potential police activity, not great. Also not a spot you want to put the hostesses more than anything. The very first thing that comes to my mind is you had your daughter and some of her girlfriends on this trip, which means anyone that goes with you on this trip should act accordingly. This isn't their time to go to Vegas and do that type of a thing. Maybe they go back at another time. I understand this was very timely because AV Ed was in town, but still you have to take a hard pass because you brought them on this trip and as well, your daughter and her friends. So I don't think you overreacted. And I think the fact that you're organized enough about this in advance to have a little contract that says, Hey, you break my rules. This is how it goes. What you're doing is you're limiting your liability. You are making sure that if somebody else gets into a situation that involves the police in a room that is in your name, that you are not attached. That's self-preservation, bruh, to the highest form, and you're doing it all right. The next question is, from a woman's point of view, what goes through their mind when a casino hostess goes up to them and asks if they like to party with a guest of a high roller? I wouldn't know because that's not something I would be involved in. I think if somebody just asked me, I'd be like, what are you crazy? But I think I don't put off that that's something to ask me. And I'm sure the hostesses have a list of, of people they can ask something like that. If they even do ask something like that, because I don't know if legally they're allowed, maybe, maybe to party like a bachelor party. Yes, they could do, if it's sex, they couldn't do, because that would be on the, the thing. But I don't think it's just random, right? But if somebody asked me, I'd be annoyed because obviously I'm in Vegas doing my own thing, having fun with my friends. So I hope that answers that part. He says, are they as disgusted like I was or would they even go? So I think they'd be working off a list of women that they already know, but if it was random, they'd probably be a little disgusted. Even though my casino hostess asked me before trying to accommodate this awful request, I feel I owe every woman at that convention an apology that someone in my party would ever ask for women. You're so nice. You're so respectful. You're going to be such a good dad, such a good man, such a good example. To my surprise, when I got back home, my ex-friend gave me a gift. It was a lawsuit. He wants me to reimburse him all the money he had to spend that weekend on hotel, plane fare, food, and the amenities he had to pay for. I will be very happy to defend this frivolous lawsuit. I would too. You have a contract. And there's no way this is, this is, it's frivolous. It's petty, but like, Hey, if somebody wants to go to Vegas and do it their way, then they do that on their dime. So what he's saying is because he couldn't get everything for free and have all the fun he wanted to have that he wants to sue you. No, I would like to believe that just cause Las Vegas is called sin city. That doesn't mean that you should give up your morals. If possible, I'd really like to know your opinion. And if possible, some opinions of your girlfriends in the industry. For the record, my asks for casino hostess have always been reservations at certain restaurants, daytime excursions around Las Vegas, and shows that are at Caesar Palace where I stay or other hotels. I keep it very simple. That's what you're supposed to ask your casino hostess for is those things. And that's why you have one and you've earned that and you use it for the right thing. And, and it's great for them too, because they're keeping the business with other casinos that are connected to them, right? They're helping everybody make money. That's really what a hostess does is gets you to have the best experience in Vegas. Jordan, you are 100% right here. I like how you roll. You did the right thing and keep me posted. Keep us posted on how this lawsuit goes, if it goes at all, because if this person is trying to just get a quick bit of cash from you, uh, can this person even afford to endure what a court cost, court case costs? Because at that point, 
It would be cheaper for this person to just take the fact that they didn't follow the rules and pay for their own food, airfare, and room like any normal person going to Vegas would have to do anyway than try and take this to court. And I'm sorry you lost a friend over it. But at the end of the day, you probably realized this isn't somebody that their values do not align with yours. And so you probably weren't going to be friends forever anyway. It's never fun when it ends, but you did the right thing and you're continuing to do the right thing. So thanks for the email. Here we go. We got one from David. Subject says, this week's YouTube show. Greetings and salutations. By the way, deleting all the creepy emails and getting to this goodness has been a high point in the Lisa Ann experience, okay? I'm also getting to hear from people who know how to write emails, which is fantastic. Forgive me. I know this was reserved for dating questions this week, but I'd just like to commend you on being such a respectful woman in a very disrespectful situation. I was watching this week's podcast, and I hope anyone who was watching and or listening took to heart what you had to say and sees that they should trust their intuition when put into a precarious situation. You showed great respect, not only for yourself, but for your brand and to him. Thank you for being open and honest with those of us who listened or watched your podcast. Thanks again. Here's to much more success in your future, David. David, you rock. I thank you so much. I'm getting a lot of good feedback from expressing that. And there's one more about the same thing. And it's from Mike, Mark and, and Peggy, my favorite emailers. Hello, Miss Lisa Ann. Peggy and I both watched your podcast where you told the world about what happened with gravy. I hope I got the name right, he says. We both agree without any reservations or discussion, you did the right thing in this situation. He definitely was a candidate for dudes do better. There was no excuse for the way he treated you. It was downright disrespectful in every sense of the word. So you hold your head up, lady. You did the right thing. Love you as always, Peggy and Mark. You know, when this happened and Kay got to watch the episode. Kay was like, man, this would have been the perfect last episode for dudes do better. And it so would have been, it was so perfect. But as my new year's resolution to just do dudes do better on social media, I'm already feeling the flow of my life being easier. I'm not getting that chaos and it's not harping on that thing. And so it was worth it, but yeah, it would have been the greatest last episode, but it was also a great episode for the Lisa Ann experience. And last but not least, this email came in. I'm putting the mailbag together. I posted a photo on my Instagram, the real Lisa Ann, of a stack of books that I'm planning on rereading. And it's all inspired by Sheila. Would you consider doing a YouTube live talk about great books you would recommend for your followers to read? Not only am I considering this, Sheila, I'm going to work on this today. I'm going to start together putting together some thumbnails uh, with Kay, of course. I don't do that stuff. That's Kay's department. I'm also going to start to put together a list of books that I've already read that I've loved that I want to reread and then some new books. And I'm going to start a little online book club. How do we feel about that? I'll read the books. We can all read them together, of course, but maybe there'll be some books that I read and I come on and I talk about it, what I loved about it, what inspired me. And we can make it a live. That's why I thought if we do it as a live and I could see the comments, it'd be great to drop a book a month to start that I'm going to start reading, give everyone time to get the book if they're interested, and then we could get into a developed conversation on a monthly YouTube live about the book. So we'll decide what day that's best on, um, and we'll make this happen. But Sheila, thanks for the inspo. I appreciate it. I'm doing that. Yes, we are going to do a book club on my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann. Same place where you get to watch my podcast Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann. I've got events and I've got things going on. So let's break them down. Super Bowl Sunday, I will be at Sapphire 60 in the city watching the game with you and my friend Jaden Cole, who is going to co-host with me. I'm super excited. I'll be doing all four Exotica shows. We've got April, Chicago. We've got July, Miami. We've got October, or November. I always get those two confused. New Jersey and December of uh, DC. I'll be in Sydney, Australia at Sexpo in July. And I look forward to seeing you at my events, taking a photo, having a conversation, probably go back to AVN and sign again next year. Cause I enjoyed seeing everybody so much. I enjoyed having conversations about my podcast and the new things that I've got going on in my life. 
If you're interested in my books, The Life and The Life Back, both available on my store, Shop Lisa Ann. The, they're both available on Amazon as well, but if you get them through me, you get them signed. Amazon has the first audio book and soon to be recorded the second audio book. So lots of great stuff going on. I thank you for being here, for listening to my podcast. Share it with a, a friend. Please write a review, subscribe, rate, and review as part of how we live in this podcast world. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate Lainey Spicer for introducing me to my guest today, this conversation with Gerard Damian. Damiano. I love the name, Damiano. And when I said it to him, I said, in Italy, it would be said, here he says it's Damiano, but in Italy it would be Damiano. You would die. There's emphasis there. I love the Italian language, which I'm studying again right now as we speak. So I'd like to thank my guest. I'd like to thank all of you for listening to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. 